Beginning in 1981, physicians, including myself, who were working in, especially in California and New York City, began to see young people with an amazing new disease. How did we know it was new? The problems that we saw and the problems that we continue to see were largely in gay men, especially at first gay men who are very sexually active. And what we saw were diseases that we really had never seen before in that age group. A variety of infections, a variety of cancers. And really almost immediately we knew that there was a, a new disease in our midst. We are in the middle of an incredible epidemic. The epidemic is of AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency disease. This disease is currently increasing at the rate of approximately doubling every nine months. AIDS is a new disease. It is usually transmitted sexually. It probably developed in Africa in the mid-1970s, then found its way to New York, to Los Angeles, to San Francisco. Today, there are more than 10,000 cases of AIDS in the United States. Nearly 5,000 people have died from AIDS. Although homosexual males and intravenous drug abusers account for most of the cases of AIDS in the United States so far, there is increasing concern about the risk to the heterosexual population. In Africa, where the disease developed, an equal number of males and females have the virus. The disease there is spread primarily through heterosexual sex. Will this become the future pattern of AIDS in the United States? I think it's very important that we understand exactly what AIDS is. And to do that, we have to have a clear definition of the disease. Now, the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, in 1981, defined the disease as follows. A strange or unusual malignancy or a strange and unusual infection in a patient that shouldn't have one. Now these include patients with Kaposi sarcoma, with pneumocystis pneumonia, diseases that we've known about for years, but this is the first time we've seen them in patient populations where they are now occurring. We also know that the disease process itself will present in other ways. When you make a diagnosis of AIDS in a patient, it essentially means that he has 100% mortality. So we never make this diagnosis lightly. AIDS is caused by a virus, probably a new virus. A virus is a tiny particle that can be seen only with an electron microscope. Each microorganism that invades the body has unique chemical markers on its surface. The shape of that marker works like a lock. Each B cell carries a particular key or antibody on its surface. When a B cell discovers an invader with a lock that matches its key, it sets off an alarm to warn the troops. T cells also join the assault. One type of T cell, the T helper cell, responds by sending chemical signals to stimulate other B cells to multiply into a full-scale army that hunts down similar invaders. When the infection is under control, other T cells, known as T suppressor cells, send signals that call off the troops. In a healthy individual, there are twice as many T helper cells as T suppressor cells. In people with AIDS, this ratio is reversed. In advanced cases, there are virtually no T helper cells left to turn on the immune system. Invading microbes take advantage of this opportunity and proliferate. These so-called opportunistic infections are what actually kill the AIDS patient. And that really is what AIDS is all about. Now, where does the virus live? It stands to reason that if it attacks these helper cells, it will live wherever those helper cells go. We now know it's found in blood. We now know it's found in semen. And we also now know it's found in saliva. It may be found in other secretions that haven't been tested yet. The vast majority of cases of AIDS in the United States have occurred in gay or homosexual males. This accounts for approximately 73% of all patients with AIDS in the United States. 
the next most common group are the intravenous drug abusers, and they account for around 17%. Hemophiliacs account for approximately 1%. Now, both the intravenous drug abusers and the hemophiliacs probably get the virus by direct injection of contaminated substances into the bloodstream. We now know that factor eight, which we have been giving our hemophiliacs for years to stop their bleeding, did contain the virus. The process used to develop the factor eight didn't kill the virus. We've had a few, although surprisingly few cases of AIDS in which the virus has been transmitted by transfusion of blood or blood products. Now this should disappear with the new test, which at the present time is being used to test essentially all units of blood transfused into people in the United States. How do I know when, a, when either I or one of my patients or one of my friends might be developing AIDS? The answer is really much more difficult than a lot of people expect. It's difficult because we now know that a person after being exposed to the AIDS virus may have any one of a number of different things happen as a result. Some of the people infected with the AIDS virus may develop no symptoms at all, even though the virus is attacking their immune systems. As the virus continues to destroy helper T cells, the patient may then show signs of AIDS-related conditions. When the immune system becomes severely damaged, the patient may then develop what is diagnosed as AIDS, a fatal disease. When the immune system breaks down, the person is susceptible to a wide range of different infections and cancers, and the symptoms are, real, are really those of those specific infections or cancers. I would say that there are some general symptoms that are shared by people with a variety of different forms of AIDS. Those are feeling of fatigue, out of proportion to the amount of exertion that the person may have just performed. Fevers, usually high fevers over 100 degrees and lasting for more than two weeks. Night sweats, by which we mean really drenching sweats at night. Persons complaining of this often say they feel as though they've just gotten out of the shower. The sweat is literally dripping from them. Or weight loss, greater than 10% of the person's healthy body weight. If we see symptoms like that, especially if the person is in a risk group for AIDS, and primarily that means homosexually active men or intravenous drug users, then we become concerned about the possibility of this disease. I would stress that the symptoms of AIDS are often very confusing because of the symptoms of any chronic infection. Often there are the symptoms of any chronic malignancy, so it can be very difficult early in the stages of this to be sure that it's AIDS. Later on, what we often see are symptoms of the specific infections that the person has. Because pneumonia, pneumocystis pneumonia especially, is the most common infection seen with AIDS, the common symptoms seen with those patients are usually those of, of a diffuse pneumonia. Shortness of breath, especially with minimal exertion, a severe cough, and especially if the cough isn't productive of sputum, and the sense of chest tightness or pain are common symptoms of pneumocystis pneumonia. Generally, they're associated with fevers or night sweats, so it's, it's common for a person to have all of these symptoms simultaneously. Those would lead us to look very carefully at that person's chest x-ray to obtain additional studies to prove or disprove the presence of that parasitic infection. The other common disease that we've mentioned is Kaposi's sarcoma. Kaposi's sarcoma is a tumor that appears on the skin in the majority of people who have this malignancy. Kaposi's appears as a raised lesion, something you can actually feel with your fingertip, and in its early stages is usually painless and doesn't itch. It's usually pigmented, it looks bluish to purplish in color, and very importantly, it doesn't blanch when you press on it. 
again, if we see skin lesions that resemble that in a person that otherwise in a, is in a risk group for AIDS, we'd be very concerned about Kaposi sarcoma. Kaposi's is very easy to prove on a skin biopsy, and that can be done with no discomfort whatsoever with local anesthesia, and the diagnosis can be established by most competent pathologists. The other symptoms of AIDS are more unusual. AIDS can cause infections in the spinal fluid or in the brain itself, and we can see people with severe headaches or with personality changes or in some cases seizure disorders. Other common infections seen with AIDS include infections of the, of the retina, of the, of the eye itself, with virus infections like cytomegalovirus. This can be a problem, and the person can complain of visual loss, blurred vision, and that would lead us to that specific diagnosis. What happens after the diagnosis of AIDS has been established? The course of the disease can run from months to years, depending upon the specific forms of illness the immunodeficiency is causing. Death can occur within a few weeks of diagnosis, but that's not usual. People with milder infections or with Kaposi sarcoma can often live for two, three, or four years, possibly even more. So it's very important to realize that medical care for these patients may be long-term and involve many areas of medicine. We've also appreciated that because AIDS is such a serious disease and causes such social stigma and usually terminates in the person's death, that the care has to address psychosocial issues as well. The care has to address the fact that these are young people really at their peak in terms of, in terms of their employment and their careers in many cases, losing their jobs, losing their insurance, and we have to provide the medical social workers of, that we have to help them, help the persons with AIDS adjust to this change in their, in their living situation. Very difficult problem. And probably, if we're successful in the clinic and taking care of AIDS patients, it's more in the psychosocial support that we're able to provide than in the medical care. So we feel very strongly that the care has to be multidisciplinary from the medical perspective and from the psychosocial perspective as well. San Francisco has a number of organizations that provide special residences for AIDS patients or allow for them to be cared for in their own homes. San Francisco General Hospital has a specialized unit specifically for the care and treatment of patients with AIDS. We started that unit about a year and a half ago in, in, uh, in 1983 and have found, contrary to some expectations, that this would become a leper colony, that people would be afraid to be there, that staff wouldn't want to work there, or that visitors wouldn't want to visit their friends on that ward, that it, the exact opposite has happened. In fact, the AIDS unit has been a shining success, and it's been a success because we appreciated the need for community involvement from the start, and the need that this not be seen as an isolation ward, but rather as a special care unit. Let's think for a minute about who does not get AIDS. Healthcare workers. In our institution, we have had an intense exposure to this disease for almost four years. Not a single one of our healthcare workers has gotten AIDS, and not a single one of the healthcare workers that we have studied has even developed an antibody to AIDS. Now that to me appears to be very convincing evidence that even though we're in an environment with a lot of cases of AIDS, it just is not transmitted casually. That includes many people who have been accidentally stuck with needles contaminated with blood from AIDS patients. So even in that situation, the virus isn't transmitted and doesn't set up an, an infection. So I think we can be extremely reassuring to healthcare workers of all types and to the general public that this disease, as we've been saying, is not one of casual contagion. It doesn't spread that way. It doesn't spread by saliva on coffee cups or cigarettes. It doesn't spread by coughing or by touching a person. It spreads by direct sexual contact and by transfusion of large quantities of infected blood. 
our current recommendations for hospital staff are that people with AIDS or people who might be carrying the virus be treated as any other patient. That in all patients, we can easily recommend good hygienic practices. We can always recommend washing hands after seeing a patient, after examining a patient. We can always recommend wearing gloves when in contact with, with body wastes. Those are the kind of routine things that should always be done anyway, whether or not you suspect the, the AIDS virus. We know furthermore that the AIDS virus is actually very fragile. Although it causes a terrible disease, the virus is easily damaged outside of the body. The virus that causes AIDS has a lipid, a fatty coating that's disrupted by most strong detergents. So the act of washing your hands or wa washing a, a tabletop isn't just an act of, of futility. It, it actually probably is disrupting any virus that might be present. So we think that the care of AIDS patients can be done in the way that all other patient care is done safely with no real concern to hospital workers. What about vaccines? Yes, vaccines are potentially a way to stop the epidemic. However, there's a lot of problems with vaccination against this form of virus, a virus that actually may change its characteristics during the epidemic. There's a lot of people at the present time working on the potential solution with vaccines. What about antiviral drugs? There are a number of compounds that are being tested aggressively at the present time that have activity against the virus in the test tube. So far, we have not been impressed that any of these agents has much of an impact on the disease. We will continue, and the medical community will continue to examine new agents, to develop new agents, to develop new vaccines. But I think it's important that everybody realize that there is no vaccine or there is no imminent cure right around the corner. We think that the disease, unfortunately, is going to be with us for a long time. It will get more common because the epidemic is still growing. But hopefully we can apply what we've learned to begin to slow the epidemic.